Ba -da -ba -ba. How do you think fans returning in full stadiums will impact your business and your marketing expense? Well, that's an interesting question. I think that you know more people going to games means more engagement with sports, which should be a good thing. That said, um, you know we've been saying the stay-at-home nature of the pandemic has been a positive benefit for us. I think the larger impact is going to be if people are returning to stadiums, are they also returning to other activities like travel and leisure, dining out? Those are the big categories of spend that we think you know some portion of has shifted in the direction of online offerings such as DraftKings. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably more, meaning fans and stands, is more of a proxy for other sorts of behaviors than itself a direct impact. I think in of itself it's probably, you know, neutral, um, you know, plus or minus slightly one way or another, but, but not really a significant thing. How do you plan to differentiate your products over time to stand out from your competition? Well, this is what I think we do best. We're at our, car, our heart a product and technology company. Um, we're also very customer centric, so I think we have a good idea of the short term roadmap. We're going to be migrating over to our proprietary technology and trading stack in the, in the fall. Uh, and then I think from there, you know, there's probably a focus pretty heavily on in-game betting. Uh, I think on the online, uh, on the iGaming side, we're going to continue to focus on launching our own games. That's been a very successful strategy for us. It's allowed us to become the number one brand in iGaming in America. Uh, that's really come you know, uh, to, I think, fruition in, in some of these new states, particularly Michigan, where we saw over 75% of the revenue, uh, excuse me, of the handle generated in Michigan come on our own iGaming content. Um, you know, from there, I think we're really going to focus on listening to the customer. As I said, we're a very customer-centric company, so um, both between kind of looking at the data and understanding how customers engage, as well as having strong feedback loops from our, uh, with our customers through things like market research, focus groups, uh, feedback from our player reps, our customer service and experience teams. That all informs where we want to take the product and you know sometimes you don't find out until the next phase of evolution happens where it makes sense to go from there. So we certainly have a good short-term product roadmap meaning for the next year or two but I'm excited to listen to our customers and really understand where they would like to see us innovate and you know that'll really inform the go-forward roadmap beyond that. Can you comment on the convergence of media and sports betting? Is that a threat or an opportunity for DraftKings? I think that's a very exciting opportunity for DraftKings. Um, as you've seen, certainly over the last year, we've established a number of partnerships with media companies, and we think that that could be a great route for us. Uh, those relationships are, are a really important part of how we see the integration happening. We've also recently established a relationship with DISH, uh, and that's something that I think could pave the way for an exciting new way for these two things to converge. Um, we've also, you know, have a small uh, investment that we've made that we're considering, you know, whether or not to ramp up in our own uh, content creation, and, you know, that's something that I think will be very complementary to some of the key relationships that we've established. Can you make any additional comments on your announcement with DISH last week? Is this something that can be replicated with other providers? That's the hope. Um, we're really excited about this. It's something that, you know, we think sort of, you know, if it goes well, could be groundbreaking. Um, it'll feel to the user like they're able to place a bet directly from their TV. Now, in reality, it'll be, you know, a communication between the, the streaming device and the iPhone or other, you know, whatever other uh, Android, uh, you know, whatever other smartphone um, that they have the DraftKings app on. So. Uh, it's not actually going through the TV, but it'll feel that way to the user. Um, so, you know, we don't know how, how different users will like to, will prefer to engage with us. You know, some will actually just say, hey, I got a phone, why do I need to do that? Others will say, well, if I can watch the streaming and make bets in the same place, that feels a whole lot more convenient. And what we really want to do is be, be there for any user in any way that they want to engage. Uh, and give people the most options, the most convenience, the most engaging products. And I think it's also an example, as was mentioned earlier, of where media and gaming can start to converge as well. Uh, being able to, in this case, watch the same thing, uh, watch, excuse me, and bet, uh, or at least feel like you're watching and betting on the same device. As far as what it could do in, uh, with other relationships, I think that there will be others that once they see this in action are going to be interested, and we're certainly open to pursuing those discussions. How important is streaming for betting for long-term player engagement, monetization, and retention? I think the most important thing is that people can watch it somewhere. Where we've seen great impact with streaming are on having streaming integrated for things that people can't watch in the U.S. Um, you know, when we, for example, rolled out streaming on some international soccer or 
uh, you know, on ping pong. Um, those are examples where you know, we couldn't actually, people couldn't you know, find places to watch it. I think as long as people can watch it, it's going to be, you know, uh, that, that's going to be the predominant factor. One other thing I'd add, though, is that, and this is a big opportunity, I think, right now, due to latency in the broadcast, there's actually a disconnect where the data on the uh, smart device for, for DraftKings updates faster than the action on screen, which isn't a great customer experience. So I think that, as you see, leagues consider lower latency products, and, you know, they may consider doing that in an integrated fashion through us. Uh, we certainly hope so. Um, you know, that could actually be a big opportunity simply from improving the customer experience. But I think the important thing is that you can watch it somewhere, that it's synced up between the data on the phone and the data and the, uh, the action on the screen. Um, and as long as that's the case, you know, it could be directly through us, it could be through partners that are doing streaming, um, really doesn't matter. Uh, I think it's just important that people have access to a good experience. What impact do you expect from Android users being able to download your sportsbook and iGaming apps directly from the Google Play Store? Well, that should be a huge positive for us. Uh, we've done our best through sideloading to try to get people to download the app, but it's not a great customer experience by any means. You know, it's clunky. Um, there's weird messages that you get when that happens. Uh, and it also doesn't allow us to advertise in the Google Play Store, um, being that we don't have an app there. So for all those reasons, we think that should have a very positive impact on driving both customer acquisition as well as adoption of our app by existing Android users. I'm interested in your thoughts on the following products. First with eSports, you mentioned it earlier in the year, but we haven't heard much about it. And then what are your thoughts on the poker markets and or the horse racing markets? Well, eSports was a huge uh, grower during the, the pandemic when there were no traditional sports being played. We saw eSports. We'd kind of been waiting for that moment. Um, everybody, you know, every year was like, is this the year that eSports really takes off? And it happened. Um, and what's been cool to see is that while other substitute products have kind of lost some momentum, eSports has really kept it. We're still running very large eSports pools, much larger than we were running r before the pandemic. Uh, and that's with all traditional sports having come back. So that's been really great to see. Um, right now, it's been a little bit more of a focus on the DFS side because you know a lot of states still are not allowing betting on esports. That's something that we hope evolves over time, and we're excited to continue to innovate in the esports place. As far as poker and horse racing, those are those are two products we've looked at, um, and we're just balancing those things you know across our product roadmap uh, with other things that we could be doing. But um, obviously, our goal is to ultimately have every type of product that the customer wants and to be able to engage people on all key events and at all times. So I think that those are certain things that we will take a look at. Is DraftKings open to utilizing cryptocurrencies? It's something we've certainly explored. Um, we know that it's popular with many of our customers. Um, I think that, you know, being in a regulated industry, uh, there's obviously has to be a conversation with regulators uh, around whether they're comfortable with that. And right now they're not. So, um, you know, we haven't really uh, been able to, to move in that direction. Um, but it's something we're keeping a close eye on, and uh, I think should the opportunity arise, we would, we would have to consider it strongly. Do you expect advertising to ever be a significant contributor to revenue? Is this a business that you can grow in the future? We think it'll be, you know, something that we do. Right now, we do have advertising on some of our content on our free games. Um, we have premium advertisers such as Netflix, Amazon, uh, Budweiser, uh, Pepsi, others that uh, have been you know, seeing great results. Um, we have chosen in a, and will continue to choose not to on our paid sports betting product, on our um, paid DFS app uh, to take ads. We do have a little bit on our website, but that's not where most of the customers are engaging right now. So yes, we will probably continue to do that, but I think if it does become more meaningful, it'll be because we make a more significant foray into the content space. And um, I think that's really, if anywhere, um, where we will go. We actually are seeing more demand uh, from advertisers than we have inventory right now. We've had to turn advertising dollars down, so it could be a bigger line item if we are willing to actually uh, put ads into our paid products, which you know, outside of the website for DFS we have not been and do not intend to. Um, so you know, I think it'll really be, can we grow inventory through more free to play? Can we grow inventory through a, b a deeper content investment? And uh, if so, I think you'll see an increase in ad revenues. How do you think about M&A? With SB Tech, do you have a full product suite or are there areas you may look to do some bolt-ons? Um, you know, I think bolt-on is a, a good way of describing one of the categories we're looking at. 
I think you know international expansion is another area that might be of interest. Um, I think media is another area that might be of interest. So those are all categories that we're looking at. Um, capabilities, you know, for some small tuck-ins are also things we're looking at. Uh, right now, we feel like there's nothing we need. The one thing we really felt we needed was our own proprietary sports betting platform. Um, you know, and that that we got with the business combination with SB Tech last year and Diamond Eagle. So. Um, we feel like in the need category, we're all set. Uh, a lot of what remains is kind of, you know, what's interesting out there that might be an opportunity. There's a lot of build versus buy analysis. Um, so it's more opportunistic than anything else. And um, if we see good opportunities emerge, we're, we're going we're gonna to go after them. But uh, we're also going to stay very disciplined and only do deals if they're the right ones because we really don't feel like we need anything at this point. How should we think about your EBITDA losses potentially in 2021 versus 2020. What about the seasonality of EBITDA this year on a quarterly basis? Well, you know, as we've said in the past, we're a very data-driven company and, you know, most of the investment that we're making in marketing, or all of, excuse me, the investment that we're making in mar marketing is driven by what the data is telling us. So, uh, as I noted this year, or this past year, I should say, uh, we saw incredibly you know, efficient performance. Our CAC was lower than what we expected, so we just kept investing deeper, and that got better in the back half of the year as more sports returned, more traditional sports, I should say, returned um, from the COVID hiatus. So um, that's really what caused it. As far as how it will look in future years, I think generally you'll always see Q3 and Q4 be a bigger area of EBITDA loss for us, at least in this growth phase as we spend more in marketing. Um, and you know, obviously Q3 even more substantial than Q4 on most years. So uh, with the caveat that we'll always direct spend based on what the data is saying, and therefore there's always some natural variance just based on how things are performing. I think the general trend will be Q3 is, is going to be, you know, in these growth years where we are operating at a loss, Q3 will be the greater losses, Q4 next, and Q1 uh, probably following that. Did I get that right, Jason? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And I, I would just reiterate that the complexion of the different states where we are live and the different maturity of those states is really the underlying driver of our adjusted EBITDA by quarter. Um, as we show the unit profitability over time, the more states that you have pushing into that second, third, or fourth year offset by whatever legalization scenario unfolds over the coming years, the balance of those two is, is driving the EBITDA uh, for the entire enterprise. That's a great point. Um, so, you know, to, to sort of give an example, um, if all of a sudden California went live in Q1, that would, you know, cause us to ramp up investment and that would have, you know, nothing to do with sort of what steady state trends are. That would just be a huge state launched in a particular time of year. Uh, and we see, you know, great opportunity to invest in, in acquiring customers. Also, um, there are things even within states. So for example, this year, Illinois issued an executive order that suspended the in-person registration requirement that kept getting extended. And we just kept seeing better and better performance in Illinois. I believe Illinois is actually our largest online sports betting state now. Um, so, you know, that also caused us to keep investing. We had assumed initially that it would not get extended um, because we didn't want to count on something that wasn't within our control to, to make our top line numbers. But, uh, you know, once it got extended and we saw, you know, such tremendous performance on the customer acquisition side in Illinois, we just continued to invest there. It looks like your long-term adjusted EBITDA margin percentage is about flat compared to your last update from early last year. Why is it not higher? Well, what we did here, and um, you know, again, we're trying to kind of exercise caution and not overpromise anything, is we assume that with a larger TAM, we would be making deeper investment into products. So most of the increased cost here is increased product and engineering investment. Um, that certainly we think may happen, um, maybe not, but. Also, we think that that investment would make sense in a scenario like this because this still assumes, you know, 70% of the U.S. does not have iGaming, 35% do not have sports betting online, also doesn't have any consideration of international expansion beyond Canada. Um, so, you know, I think at this stage of the business with those upsides still out there, we assume we would still be investing pretty heavily in growing our product and tech. And, um, you know, that doesn't mean that future revenue won't uh, come in at a higher margin rate. We just didn't want to make that assumption in this case. What is behind the significant increase in your long-term SG&A expenses? Well, it's, you know, it's exactly what I just said. I think we're, in, in this case, we're assuming 
uh, that we will continue to invest deeply in product and technology uh, as we ramp into that higher TAM. That's a very controllable cost for us. We can choose to do it or not. It's not a variable cost by any means. So we, we you know, none of the product and tech in SGNA is variable, of course. So uh, our thought is that if we see a larger TAM opportunity, if we see increased momentum on potentially getting more states allowing online sports betting, iGaming, if we see an opportunity to expand internationally, that those investments will make a whole lot of sense. And, uh, if we don't, then we may pair them back a little bit, but uh, our assumption in this case is that it'll be the former, not the latter, that happens. Given your strong market share in OSB and iGaming in Q4 of 2020, what would be the reason or reasons that share could decline toward the midpoints of your long-term targets? I don't know that it will. Um, I think we just wanted to be you know, prudent in that and not assume that everything would go 100% you know, according to plan. I think there's reasons why we might be able to increase share, particularly uh, the investment that we plan on making in product. And you know, that's really going to start with this migration. And then ultimately, we think we have years and years ahead that we'll be able to continue to innovate and put distance between our product and competitor products. So I think there's reasons to believe there's upside, but also there's you know, reasons to believe that there might be increased competition and things like that, too. So we just felt it was prudent to say that we're not counting on everything going 100 percent according to plan. And even if it doesn't, even if we did decline a little bit, we think that this is still a very attractive opportunity. It doesn't mean we think that's what's going to happen. We just wanted to show that as like, hey, even if we go down a bit in market share, we think that we're actually going to still have a really attractive business at maturity. So, what are your thoughts? Are you bullish, bearish? Don't give a damage? Personally, I like this stock.